So welcome. Um, my name is Gavin Bannerman. Um, I'm the Director of Queensland Memory at the State Library of Queensland. And um, on behalf of my, um, my colleagues, I'd like to welcome you to the State Library of Queensland for the first of our Research Reveals um, event, which is a series that we'll be running um, over the next month. Um, this is the very first Research Reveals event. Um, there's one following um, this next week with um, Peter Rowenfeld um, talking about um, the Albert Hall and the history of that in Queensland's music history. Um, we will be fo filming a component of um, this evening, um, the talks and the presentation, but not the um, collection displays upstairs. And the video will be available for um, public viewing in the coming weeks. So if somebody you know was unable to make it, um, our camera op operator up there will be doing a great job to capture all the action. So you can you can share that. And also if you want to revisit and go back over things, there'll be a full recording of um, Hillary's presentation. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land um, and pay respects to the ancestors who came before them. This location at Cropper Point has been a um, traditional meeting, sharing and gathering place for Aboriginal people. And I just want to acknowledge that we continue, continue that tradition here today at the State Library. Um, I'd also like, like to acknowledge um, some of the special people who are here tonight. Um, tonight's speaker, Dr Hilary Davies, the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame uh, Fellowship recipient for 2018, founding partners and sponsors of the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame, Helen Brody, who I don't think has been able to make it yet, but um, she is our, the president of our Queensland Library Foundation, members of the Queensland Library Foundation Council and Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame Governing Committee. So I saw Helen um, Grigorian, thank you for coming, um, and others. Uh, also donors and supporters of the State Library of Queensland and the Queensland Library Foundation. Um, thank you very much for your support and making things like tonight possible. Um, I'd also, are there, um, I haven't seen, is, is Rutian here tonight? No? Oh, Rutian, how are you going? So um, has any anyone who has been a fellow or is a fellow, do you want to just put up your hands? Yeah, I can, two, yeah. So um, we do like to encourage that um, cohort and the, the um, you know, the, the graduates of our fellowship program and once a fellow, always a fellow at State Library. So we really welcome those um, fellows past and present. Um, so tonight we focus on the 2018 Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame fellow Dr Hilary Davies and her research into the um, Canada Cycle and Motor, Motor Agency in Limited Queensland. Now apologies, after that, it's the first time you're going to hear that um, spoke, said all the way through. I will give the acronym of um, CCMA uh, after that, so um, that's the first and last time you're going to hear that one from me, um, which was a leading um, company in Queensland cycling and early motor industry between 1905 and 1930. Hillary's project has endeavoured to spotlight CCMA's influence on Queensland's business landscape. Through her investigations, Hillary has contributed new knowledge about Queensland's early motoring industry. Hillary began her interest in CCMA when she was inquiring about the early taxi industry. She learnt that CCMA started the first motorised taxi business in Queensland and she wondered what is this Queensland business with such a foreign name. Um, personally, I, I, I'm very fascinated with Hillary's research. Um, it continues um, something which I, I've had a personal interest in. I run events with um, about vintage bicycles, and people have been, you know, very interested in the manufacture of bicycles in Queensland. I've done a few sort of investigations in the history of you know, Jack Pesh and Tom Wallace and all these sorts of things, and um, I see this kind of crossover between people who are really into bikes and people into cars and um, the the issues of restoring and finding more about and tracing the provenance and all that sort of thing. So just seeing from the enthusiasm sort of outside, I'm, I'm getting that, that feeling that there is an enthusiasm about, um, you know, Queensland's hist um, history of car making. Um, I'm also... Um, just want to give a quick plug to our fellowship program as well. Um, every year we run a fellowship program um, which gives opportunities for people to do their research projects with the support of State Library. We generally put a call out for applications for that in early, um, early in the year, just in late January. So just keep an eye out in early 2020. We'll have a call for the Queensland Memory Awards for our fellowships and awards. So um, without further ado, I'd like to... Um, Welcome Hillary to the stage. I'd like to thank again our um, founding part, um, our sponsors and supporters in making this possible. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Gavin. Good evening, everyone. One moment. Okay. Putting 
Queenslanders on road, the Canada Cycle and Motor Agency, Queensland Limited. Okay, the importance of the motor industry in Queensland history is hard to question. Before 1900, there were no automobiles in Queensland, but car ownership and motorised transport was adopted rapidly in the decades before the Second World War and achieved widespread popularity afterwards. New types of employment, new ways of performing work and new social activities were created by motorised transport and new words entered the lexicon. The motor industry in Queensland in the early 20th century was an exciting, innovative and growing industry. One of the companies leading the way was the Canada Cycle and Motor Agency, often called the CCM. Established in 1905, the CCM quickly expanded from primarily selling bicycles and sporting equipment into motor vehicles and motorboats, marit marine and um, stationary engines and later into electrical lighting systems and radios. With branches and agencies throughout Queensland and in Lismore and approximately 200 employees by 1914, the CCM was a major Queensland company during the first three decades of the 20th century. The CCM evolved from the Canada Cycle and Motor Company, which had been established in Canada in 1899 from merging five bicycle companies. It opened branches in Australia, New Zealand and Britain by about 1900. In Queensland, it traded from Queen Street, Brisbane, opposite the GPO, and was managed by well-known Brisbane cyclist Alexander Vaughan Dodwell. The Massey Harris cycles it sold were well regarded and purchased by many Queenslanders. In 1900, the company imported a motor tricycle, possibly the first motor vehicle into the state. By 1905, the Canada Cycle and Motor Company had sold its Australian branches. The Queensland branch was taken over by its manager, Dodwell. He formed the Canada Cycle and Motor Agency Limited with a capital of £12,000. The company's other directors were the Honourable Thomas Murray Hall, MLC, and James Johnston. The business commenced with 25 employees. Queensland's Canada and Cycle and Motor Agency should not be confused with two other companies of similar names operating in New South Wales and Victoria, which formed in a similar manner, nor with the Canada Cycle and Motor Company of Toronto, Canada. The CCM's history can be divided into three phases, its establishment period up to the start of World War I, during the war, and the post-World War I period. Soon after Dodwell took over the CCM, he began securing the Queensland agencies for a number of motive makes. Within a few months, the CCM had secured the agencies for the famous Dirac motor car, the De Dion, and the Griffin motor bicycle, all French makes, as well as the Russell motor car produced by the Canada Cycle and Motor Company in Canada. Other agencies followed, such as the British Clement Talbot and Humber, the Italian Fiat and the French Renault. Explaining the advantages of motor vehicles to businesses, community services and individuals became an important part of the CCM's marketing strategy. In June 1906, Dodwell travelled throughout North Queensland, including the Chilago Copper Fields, the Gulf Ports and as far north as Thursday Island, assessing, assessing business opportunities. At the yearly meeting of the Hatton Vale Farmers Association in 1907, Dodwell provided information about the practicality of motor vehicles for cream cartage. Similar trips and information sessions occurred thereafter. By June 1906, the company had secured premises suitable for expanding its motor business to provide a garage for car repairs and accommodation. This was on the corner of Creek and Adelaide Street, opposite the fashionable Gresham Hotel. The property was fitted with electrical light, accommodation for a dozen large cars and with all the appliances for their overhaul and repair. In mid-1907, the CCM purchased this large property fronting Adelaide and Creek Streets um, and at this position within about 200 metres of the GPO was regarded as central. Here it established its car showroom as shown. The CCM also established branches in Toowoomba, Charters Towers and Rockhampton and enlisted agents in, in towns and districts throughout Queensland to sell its vehicle to the growing number of people embracing motorisation. As well as its showrooms in Brisbane and throughout the state, the CCM sought other display opportunities. 
Beginning in 1906, the com company usually hired a stand at the Brisbane Exhibition. In, at the 1907 exhibition, the CCM and the Queensland Motor Importing Company of Toowoomba were the largest exhibitors, showing Russell, Humber and Talbot cars. A motorboat displayed by the CCM caused much admiration. The company also exhibited its vehicles and motors at regional shows. Another form of advertising used was performing and promoting feats of endurance, power and speed by the vehicles it sold. And many music newspaper articles from the era about these achievements sound like CCM media releases. One example was the feat in 1908 of driving a pony Dirac up Townsville's precipitous Castle Hill, which then had no road or track to the top. Advertising in motor magazines such as the Australian Motorist from 1906 and the Steering Wheel from 1915, as well as in newspapers, was a regular means of re reaching potential customers. Competitions were also used. In 1908, the CCM gave away a Dirac car to a lucky winner who had purchased one of its bicycles. Starting in 1912, the CCM began promoting its products through screening promotional material. In this instance, a film, a film about the American Studebaker Corporation's automobile factory showing car manufacture. Queensland's socio-economic elite took to the road for work and pleasure in this period. Buyers needed to be able to afford the £350-plus price tag for a car. Doctors were early converts to automobile transport, such as Queensland's first female doctor, Lillian Cooper, and Dr Eleanor Greenham. Walter Pike, prominent local businessman and co-founder of Pike Brothers Fashion Store for Gentlemen in Queen Street, and Brisbane dentist Thomas J. Copeland took delivery of Russell cars in 1906 and 07. Country sales were also forthcoming. James Clark, the well-known pearl fisher, purchased a Dirac in late 1906. Pastoral property managers and owners and the Charters Towers mine owners also purchased cars. The CCM's range of motorcycles included the British Triumph and BSA. Later, the USA's Indian Motorcycle and the Humber, Bradbury, Motor Reef and 20th Century Motorcycles were added to the list. These vehicles were snapped up by those wanting less expensive motorised transport. Shearers travelling between pastoral stations, overlanders and tourists, and by young men and women who with a love of speed. The CCM's expansion was furthered in 1908 by its takeover of the Queensland Motor Importing Company, which held the Talbot, Singer and Stark motor agencies for Queensland. At this time, the Talbot car was regarded as Australia's leading motor car. In 1908, the CCM needed more capital to keep up with the rapid expansion of the motor trade and to establish a marine engine branch. To supply this, the company reformed as the Canada Cycle and Motor Agency Queensland Limited with a capital of £55,000. The CCM also expanded into other fields of motorised business. In May 1909, it established in Brisbane Queen's first, Queensland's first motorised taxi service, the Taxi Cab Company Limited, which used six imported Renault cars fitted with taxi meters and driven by uniformed drivers. Later the same year, the CCM also established a taxi business in Toowoomba. The Queensland Country Life newspaper commented in the following year <coughs> that these taxi services had become a necessity among Brisbane and Toowoomba's commercial and fashionable city life. In 1910, the CCM completed the first taxi cab bodies built in Brisbane. These were of the Lord Elect type and were built for Henry Taylor of Rockhampton. By June 1911, Taylor was running three cabs in Rockhampton and the CCM had also delivered a cab to T.H. Allen of Mount Morgan. Around this time, the CCM also supplied the taxi for the first independent cabman in Brisbane, J.C. Pullen. Another phase in the uptake of motorisation was for commercial and community purposes. The CCM sold chassis with custom-built bodies for ambulances, buses and tr fire trucks. It supplied a motorised ambulance to the Brisbane Ambulance Brigade in 1909. An Albion motor truck was supplied to the Milton Volunteer Fire Brigade in 1910 and immediately proved its worth. Other service vehicles followed. 
to the Ipswich Ambulance Brigade shown here, the Ipswich Fire Brigade and the Queenton and Charters Towers Fire Brigade. By 1908, the CCM was selling commercial vehicles by importing Albion chassis suitable for heavy cartage up to seven tonnes and supplying custom-built bodies for them. In October 1910, the CCM supplied a lorry with a custom body constructed at the Austral Carriage Works to Adam Henderson of Rockhampton. By December that year, the CCM had supplied to CE Woods an Albion motor bus to convey 23 passengers from South Brisbane Station to Campbell Street, Bowen Hills. Queensland Country Life newspaper deemed this service a wonderful success. The company also supplied the 30-seater comma bus seen here, used by Mr Canaan for the first motorised bus service between New Farm and North Quay in 1911. The body was constructed and fitted in the CCM's Fortitude Valley workshop. Sales of trucks in the Longreach district took place after vehicle demonstration there in 1911. A different type of commercial vehicle sold by the company at this time was the mighty Atom Auto Carrier, which was advertised in 1911 as the first auto carrier imported into Queensland and suitable for butchers, bakers, drapers and allied trades. Well-known Brisbane department store Finney Isles purchased one of these vehicles for its deliveries. The CCM's growth in the lead up to World War I was rapid. And to accommodate this, the company constructed a three-storey building designed by architect Richard Gailey for the site on the corner of Adelaide and Creek Streets. In late 1910, the CCM moved into its building, registering it as the company's office. There, Renault, Talbot, Standard, BSA, Humber, Studebaker and Russell cars were displayed and repairs were conducted on site. The CCM's other Brisbane premises re reflected the differing aspects of its business. At 280 Queen Street was the sports department where bicycles and a diverse range of sporting equipment were sold. The CCM, over its whole lifetime, maintained its involvement in cycling by sponsoring races and awards. The, in 1909, the CCM leased land at Newstead Terrace, Newstead, and opened a marine motor department, which built, repaired and hired out motorboats, as well as providing boat mooring and storage. I can't give you the exact location, but if anyone knows, I'd love to hear. Um, these premises closed by October 1916. The company's Fortitude Valley workshop, um, shown on the left, and you've seen other photos outside this today, um, made customised bodies for CCM imported chassis and operated from about 1911 until the company's closure. In this early phase of operation up to the commencement of World War I, the CCM achieved remarkable growth, as did the motor industry in general, with around 3,000 cars and 2,000 motorcycles in Queensland in 1914. In May 1913, the Brisbane Courier newspaper could say, during the last 10 years, no business perhaps has made greater progress than the CCM, the sales of the company today being 600% greater than they were six or seven years ago. And when CCM staff farewell Dodwell on a world trip in March 1914, 200 staff assembled to do so. Over its lifetime, the CCM was in comp competition with other motor sales companies. In 1906, the CCM and J. Howard & Co. were the biggest firms in the motor industry in Brisbane. By the time the Motor Traders Association formed in March 1916, the principal firms in Queensland as well as the CCM were WM Trevithan, Evers Brothers, E.G. Eager & Son, Howard Motor Company, Dalgetty & Co., A.J. Lever & Co., Queensland Motor Agency and Stedman and Mackay. The First World War, commencing in August 1914, brought to the economy inflation, higher costs and higher wages due to manpower shortages. It had an immediate and lasting effect on the CCM. About 50% of its workforce volunteered for service, including managers, salesmen and workmen. Throughout the war, the CCM supported the war effort Within weeks of the outbreak of hostilities, the company had donated to the Australian Forces a Renault car with a customised CCM body to carry a machine gun and its crew. You can see on the left. This machine gun carrier was presented to the 2nd Light Horse Regiment at Inaugura in September 1914. 
later with other Studebaker dealers in Australia, the CCM donated a six-cylinder Studebaker to the Australian Mining Corps for their use in France. The CCM also lent equipment, such as a stationary engine, to the Grenade School at the inaugural rifle range for the duration of hostilities, cars to the Red Cross for transporting convalescent soldiers, and a truck to assist for the erection of an Anzac cottage at Inaugura for a soldier's widow. In the spirit of wartime charity, the CCM and its employees donated to a variety of causes, including the Motor Ambulance Fund and the Franco-Queensland League of Help. The company also participated in efforts to support returned soldiers, such as Waddle Day in June 1918, the purpose of which was to foster national sentiment and raise funds for the establishment of an orthopaedic hospital to treat maimed soldiers. At its premises, the CCM created an exceptionally fine display of wattle, and Mrs Dodwell, shown here, received first prize in the decorated car competition. <laughs> With British and European motor vehicle supplies cut off by war production, the CCM imported American vehicles. From 1915, its agencies included the American Republic trucks, and Indian motorcycles. However, US vehicle availability was also affected by wartime production as US manufacturers supplied Allied forces. The CCM participated in peace celebrations held in Brisbane in November 1918 and July 1919, when soldiers, nurses and floats created by various Brisbane organisations paraded through Brisbane CBD. The CCM's Pipe of Peace float the in the July 1919 Peace Parade, shown here, simultaneously celebrated peace and promoted Indian motorcycles. After the business slowdown caused by World War I, the CCM sought to resume its rapid pre-war growth while supporting peacetime recovery efforts. To take advantage of the resumption of peacetime conditions, to grow its business, re-employ its former staff and add new agencies, the CCM increased its nominal capital to £208,000 in 1919. The company welcomed about 50 returning soldiers back to their former positions or similar ones and continued to extend assistance to those who had been affected by the war. It donated goods and money to causes as Queenslanders sought to support returned soldiers, improve conditions in post-war Europe and memorialise those who had died. Post-war, the CCM added to its vehicle agencies the American-built Rio Speedwagon commercial vehicle, Dodge cars sold between 1920 and 23, and grey vehicles, as well as British-built Austin trucks tracks, and tractors and Clino cars. Later, the Lynn tractor was added to its stable of vehicles. From 1922, the CCM operated a used car department in their Brisbane premises to tap into this growing market. The company also began selling completely new products, the Alali electric light and power plant from about 1919 and radios from about 1925. It launched a new radio department selling Operadio brand radios, which it demonstrated through the state by receiving Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne radio broadcasts. Between 1922 and 1928, Queensland experienced its first and only economic boom between the outbreak of war in 1914 and the 1950s. The benefits of the boom economy were experienced throughout the state. Queenslanders embraced motorisation with enthusiasm. In the 1923 um, to 24 financial year, the state recorded the third highest number of vehicle registrations in Australia and Australia had the fifth highest vehicle registrations in the world, behind the USA, United Kingdom, Canada and France. During this period of growth, the CCM paid dividends of up to 10%. In Brisbane, where 29% of the population resided, this boom resulted in a flurry of building activity which transformed Brisbane's CBD. The CCM took part in this when, to accommodate its business expansion, it extended its headquarters by adding three storeys in 1925. This addition had been designed by architect Richard Gailey at the time of the first three storeys planning. 
In its final form, the building contained offices, car showrooms, sales areas for its many departments, a garage for repair and maintenance work, and a cinema that accommodated 200 people. Expansion was still the company's plan when in April 1927, the CCM announced it would open another branch in Townsville to better serve their northern clients. It contracted the well-known business of Leon's Motor and Cycle Works Limited for this purpose. However, later that year, for the first time, the company reported a net trading loss for the year ending 30 April 1927. This, the CCM reported, was due to a lack of inexpensive cars to sell, drought, keen competition, illness of directors and new trading conditions that were affecting the motor industry. In October 1928, the CCM petitioned for the liquidation of Leon's Motors and Cycle Works Limited in Townsville, which was indebted to the CCM for over £20,000 for interest, goods supplied and work done by the, for the company. A series of financial and business issues followed in 1929. In March, the CCM closed its Rockhampton branch. In August, the company disclosed a debt of £86,491, including £11,500 brought forward from 30 April 1928, and Dodwell resigned as managing director, although remained as a company director. In October, the company applied for a reduction of its capital in the Supreme Court. But on 1 November 1929, after more than two decades of growth and leadership in the motor industry, the CCM succumbed to the worsening economic conditions and entered voluntary liquidation, becoming an early casualty of the Great Depression that continued throughout most of the 1930s. During the liquidation process, various sections of the CCM business were sold, some to former employees, or continued through sub-agents. Dodwell established Champion Automobiles and took over the Studebaker Agency. Selling off the company's assets took time. Its Fortitude, Fortitude Valley premises were sold some time after September 1930. The CCM building was finally purchased by the Primary Producers Association in 1934 for about £30,000, having been passed in in 1930 for £33,000, well below its 1925 valuation of over £43,000. During World War II, this building was requisitioned for war purposes and used as the American Army's postal exchange. It became the focal point for the infamous Battle of Brisbane on 26 and 27 November 1942. But today, the most tangible reminder of the presence and impact of the CCM, a major company in Queensland's early motoring history, is the former CCM building, which is a locally listed heritage place. Although the CCM succumbed to financial difficulties, probably caused by its rapid expansion in the post-war period combined with worsening economic conditions, there can be no denying that while it traded, the CCM played an important role in putting Queenslanders on the road. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the supporters of the Business Leaders Hall of Fame Fellowship, um, Queensland Library Foundation, State Library of Queensland and QUT Business School, and staff of the State Library of Queensland have been generous with their time, and also to thank community members who have provided valuable information and assistance to me in the course of this research. Thank you. And I believe we're going to have questions now, so I'm ready for that. Thanks very much, Hilary. That's, um, it, it's, it's fascinating, and um, I must say, like, you, you see a fellow coming in, working, but it's so great to see actually, you know, there's nothing beats seeing the pictures up on the screen. You're like, oh, yeah, that stuff that, you know, we have in the collection. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing thing. Um, what, what was the most exciting thing to discover in, in your research? Um, I think it was um, that the CCM and its staff were involved in so many diverse uh, activities. Um, uh, and how well they were able to advertise. I mean, they must have been putting out press releases every week. There was so much advertising and so many articles about them. Um, there's amazing photographs in the collection that were really wonderful to, um, to find. Um, and the motoring magazines in the State Library collection have a wealth of information, not just about the CCM, but also about 
uh, a diverse range of, um, of motoring um, activities. There's, there's gobsmacking, you know, the women on motorcycles in the 1910s and things like that. They're really exciting um, things to find out. Um, and, uh, I mean, you talked about the, the value of CCM and how that ebbed and flowed. What was the, how many employees, like how big an organisation? Well, they had 200 employees yep. by 1914, mm -hmm. and I think they uh, got back to that level after the war. Mm -hmm. um, just doing the rough figures is nothing definite. It looks like they might have lost half of the people that 50% went to war mm -hmm. and only 50 came back. The mo bearing in mind some might not have wanted to be re-employed there, mm -hmm. it's still a pretty big number that didn't return. Um, and um, But I think that its size... Um, definitely would have got back to that 200 people if they were able to fill the double size um, building that they built in 1925. You talk a little bit about the, the managing director and, you know, often um, narratives about businesses now are all about the vision of the CEO or, you know, this, this um, you know, sort of entrepreneurial figure or this visionary, you know, moved the business in this direction. Was... Um, was the direction of CCM driven in by a particular character or, or was it strongly influenced by one particular person or was it a range of a collective? It's not really easy to say that, uh, who, who it was, but I do feel that it must have been, if not the managing director, then the, him and the, the two other directors that, that were, um, they seem to be really keen to um, capture whatever new way they, they could go to improve make their business bigger, um, you know, take the most, make the most of opportunities. Uh, at one point they were talking about going into aviation in the um, about 1920s. Uh, that's pretty big sort of vision, like let's do all of these things and now we'll go into aviation. I thought, what? <laughs> but um, they didn't, so um, perhaps as well, yeah. And what's one thing that they could have, like why did they fight, fail? What was their single biggest mistake? I don't. I can't say anything uh, definite, but I get the feeling that they um, they probably overextended. Uh, uh, they, there was a boom economy in the first part of the 20, 1920s. They built. Um, they expanded. They built that new building. They must have had um, debt from that. And I think the downturn in this in and the changed competition as well. I get the feeling that in the 1920s there were a lot more people. Um, operating in the motor trade for, uh, as competition and um, that they perhaps just overextended and it came back with in big debt that they couldn't resolve because the trading conditions were going um, backwards. And you know, I found it fascinating that they had a cinema in that um, yeah. the premises. Do you know what they were screening in, in the cinema? There were several um, different... Um, motor car related um, films and events that they had there. My favourite event they had was a fashion show in conjunction with Finney Isles in, um, and that they drove the cars up into that into um, the building and uh, had the um, models parading around. It was <laughs> extraordinary what they were up to. Yeah. Do you get that sense in a, you know, a very workplace health and safety world now that you could just do stuff that, <laughs> you know. Probably, yeah. 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 Uh, they just did, did it. How did they drive up? Oh, they would have had a ramp of Castle. some sort. Oh. They would Sorry, have in had Townsville, ramp. up Castle Hill. How Sorry. Oh, how they get up Castle yeah. Hill? Yeah, yeah. I have no idea. Have you well, been up there? Yeah. Like, oh, I've not been up there. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, but um, I went, um, went up there by road um, just yeah. a few weeks ago yeah. and uh, I have no idea how they got up there without a road. <laughs> they, I mean, it's... You know, you could go round the lower part, but it's pretty mm. steep at the mm. top. Mm. Yeah. Well, we've got two microphones here, and I know there will be people who have some specific questions for Hillary. Uh, you asked about the location of a... Um, of their the motorboat building. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to me, it looks like it's immediately <coughs> upstream of Beckless Creek. Uh, and also, um, what do they call that park there? Yeah. Newstead Park. Well, yeah. And it's where the Historical Society is. Exactly. That's right. It's so it's in Newstead Terrace, but there were a number of um, sites in that area that I circled that it could have um, it could have been. So I'm not exactly sure whereabouts on Newstead Terrace um, the building and the works were. 
Um, Brett Hampson from the studio back at Car Club of Queensland. Uh, I'm just doing, wondering, have you got any idea of the volume of vehicles they sold over the time? Um, good question. No, I don't. I'd say a lot um, because they had, they, like most um, motor companies, they had a lot of agencies when they started out. Um, I guess it might be possible to um, determine if you could um, uh, go through the advertising with the number of cars that they say they're landing. Uh, there's... Um, a lot of ads. Uh, there's, I found something like 6,000 ads in Trove uh, for CCM. So um, you could methodically go through the, um, their advertising over that, the period of their life and get an idea, probably a lower end, um, because like, perhaps they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't all be advertised um, as being, you know, this many cars landed that they were doing early on. So I don't have an answer. And unfortunately, we, we don't have the day-to-day -day records of the company. Um, they, I presume, went to the liquidator and would have been dealt with by that mm. by that process. Mm. What was your favourite car they saw? My favourite car? Um, oh, I don't know. Oh, let me think. I think um, the little baby Austin, from that, there's a gorgeous photo in front of um, the old government house. Some, you know, young blade, mm -hmm. you know, university going, <laughs> getting into his baby Austin. That's fantastic. <laughs> if we want to access... Yeah. Yeah. If we want to access uh, photos um, from the company sold the vehicles, how do we actually do that search through the state library? Um, we, we have, um, so through Hillary's presentation, she's uh, cited um, sometimes the unique identifier, so you can search um, for that. We've also, um, working with um, our researchers, where they, they produce a bibliography, so there'll be some resources and that sort of thing. But also, if you just, uh, I mean, do you want to just, what's the, what's the secret to unlocking <laughs> the catalogue? Um, well, a lot of the f images for these cars are available um, through the catalogue because they're as digital images. Um, so if you've seen one in the presentation, um, there's probably a digital image um, that you'd be able to find by accessing the catalogue. Um, other images come from that I've shown here come from motoring magazines. Um, and so you could access that magazine most probably through... Um, um, request through um, level three or four. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can just do a basic keyword search and yes. type it in. And um, I, I know we're working to this. There's some um, um, photographs where it's a photograph of the, the CCMA building, and it's just not attributed as being that building. So um, we, if you if you do have that information as well, we can add that to the record so that anybody just doing that basic search will retrieve that in their mm. results. That's right. And a lot of the images um, I found are also on the Flickr page um, that ended up... That's right. Um, I think it had 60 or 70 yeah. images. So that's probably that's worth looking yeah, at. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you know how the agencies worked. Were they privately owned? Did they have to buy the cars and the bikes? Um, oh. You know, yeah. Okay, yes, they would be... Um, individual businesses in the towns and cities throughout Queensland. And so they purchased, they made the order through the CCM because the CCM held the Queensland agency for the sale of those particular vehicles. Um, so any orders were made through the CCM um, when, they, when they had a customer that wanted a car. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Oh, they could have, yes. Um, I can't tell you whether there is a. Um, they all had the same features. I mean, some were still selling bicycles as well as motor cars. Others were um, garages and um, 
and mainly selling motor, motor vehicles, for instance, like Elvery's in Toowoomba, who were, they had a garage, they had the Studebaker, they were selling Studebakers, and they also were operating the taxi in Toowoomba that Mr Elvery and another business partner purchased from the CCM quite early on in that um, 1910, 1911 period, something like that. Just to worry. Um, Hilary, it, it seems to me that... <coughs> In Queensland history, the history of the motor vehicle has sort of been neglected in a sense and it seems to me what, what you, you, you're doing is really highlighting actually much more significant than, than we, we, you know, we've tended to sort of acknowledge. Um, so I guess there's a lot more. In terms of the numbers, I mean, I think there's, there's an absolutely fascinating document, the list of cars that were registered in 1923. There's about 12,000. The list's got 12,000 and it lists all the owners. Um, occupations, where they lived, and the vehicle type. Um, I, I'm, I'm in the process of analysing the bit, but, but so the information is actually there, you know. We, 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 can, we know, can work out in 1923 how many bakers there were mm. in Queensland, in Brisbane. Um, so, I mean, I, th I think this it, it's raises some interesting questions and much more further research about its, yeah. its influence. Oh, absolutely, Tom. I think I've just, like barely scratched the surface of the topic. Um, and like you say, they, there's uh, lists of people purchasing cars and they're published in, I think, the steering wheel and places like that, that, oh, such and such bought this car. And um, yeah, there's a lot of information. And so your, uh, the information that you have, so that's a, um, how, many how many thousand did you say in 1923? About 12,000. 12, and yet in 1914, we have that statistic of 3,000 cars and 2,000 motorcycles. So we can see what, how, you know, quickly our motorisation is taking place. And it didn't diminish uh, at all. Like, from, and throughout the 20s, there was still the rapid motorisation. Mm. There's a lot more work to do, that's for sure. Hi, Hilary, how are you? Good, thank you. <laughs> um, just a question, uh, and this probably is a little bit later than where you've gone in this presentation tonight. Yep. But can you talk about, very briefly, the outcome of the court case? Um, well, yes, I can. And I mean, I must say, I haven't... Um, I haven't... I don't have any expertise in the outcome of the court case, except that I... Um, my understanding was that the liquidators were pursuing the directors of the company. Um, and that in the end, I th the um, shareholders called a halt to it, and there was a judgment by consent, which is that there was no char there was the charges were dropped, and the claims was, were dropped, um, that there had been any um, any financial impropriety was dropped. Yeah. just ask a question about uh, safety because it was the early days of motoring and things like that were there any sort of famous cases of crashes and how the public dealt with it and how the company dealt with it given that it was sort of the early days of <coughs> that sort of thing um there are reports of accidents yes um and i'm sorry i'm trying to think it's a good question and i'm just trying to think through what um any of the cases and what happened um they're reported in the newspaper and uh, but whether there was there was a case where um, a child was killed and I believe the family um, took the taxi driver to um, to court about it but the outcome I'm sorry I just can't remember so there were incidents like that uh, accidents were happening people were killed um, and um, and I think there was also a case where um, um, a driver of, of a CCM taxi was um, uh, supposedly hit someone. Uh, I'm just sorry, I'm, it's something I haven't looked at for a little while. There it just came up when I was looking at reports. So I can't give you a definitive answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just an interesting um, story on fatal car crashes. Mm. Uh, I'm very old, as you can tell. I uh, was an ambulance uh, paramedic for 48 years and um, 
and uh, uh, one of my research topics uh, was um, early accidents and uh, and the impacts that that the discoveries out of those incidents occurred. But the first fatal uh, road traffic crash in Brisbane was in fact um, in a motor vehicle driven by a doctor, <laughs> which was really interesting <laughs> to, given your earlier comments because they were one of the few people who could afford a motor car. And, um, and uh, there were two sisters running to catch a tram in Sandgate <laughs> Road at Clayfield. And uh, one sister tried to board the tram on the, from the wrong side of the road and was cleaned up by the doctor and uh, she was severely injured. He threw her in the back of, of his car and took her to the hospital, but she subsequently died. But what was, well, which is very sad, of course, but what was interesting about that was that um, two significant changes to the law occurred and one was it became mandatory for a person to have a licence to drive a motor vehicle for the first time in Queensland. And the second one was that it became mandatory for motor vehicles to pass a tram on the left-hand side. So it was just... Uh, uh, so there's, uh, there's quite, a, quite a bit of interesting research yeah. there. Yeah. Hilary, can I just ask about your fellowship experience? Yeah. Like how many hours or, you know, how much of your life did this consume? <coughs> and you me I think you mentioned to me last night you've, you've trawled through 3,000 newspapers. Um, oh, something yes. amazing like that. Yeah. Um, well, it's taken a lot of time, but um, uh, some of you'll know I've uh, been doing it part time and working part time. Uh, so I would say um, it's taken, you know, hours every week to do uh, to cover the um, the newspaper articles and the magazines and and so on, but. It's been a great experience. I, I think it's, um, it's an amazing experience to have the opportunity to um, find out about um, an interesting period in time and an interesting industry um, and have the focus of looking at one company to do that and, and opening up that whole area was, was uh, a great experience that I certainly wouldn't um, not have done. And I'm sure if anyone else is considering doing a project um, that uh, you'd have just as much um, enjoyment. You know, it, it might take um, a, the time to do, but it's always it's worth it when you're interested in what you're doing. Brett Hampson again from the Studio Baker Car Club. Oh, I notice there's a lot of um, veteran and vintage type car club owners in the audience <laughs> this evening. Uh, how many people in the audience can trace a car back to the CCM? <laughs> Excellent. <Yeah. laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> we just had our national rally up at uh, uh, Toowoomba, which had a, a car there in particular. And it, um, the Bennett family are here to this evening, and they've got the, the information out the front if anybody wants to have a look at it. Hello, Julie Cosgrove from the Studi Baker Car Club of Queensland as well. Thank you, Hilary, for your research. I'm particularly interested in the um, in the CCM building, yes. um, and wondered whether um, you're aware of whether it's heritage protected and whether there are any remaining um, features that have been preserved to um, give a nod to the you know particular history of that building. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, it is still there and it does have local heritage um, listing uh, with the Brisbane City Council. Um, I, can't, I can't tell you what is left in, in the building because um, I haven't been in it, um, which uh, would be lovely to do. Um, I, it was re-jigged re, um, when the... Um, primary producers went in there. I know they made changes in 1934. Um, and what the changes that have been subsequently carried out, I don't know. Um, and uh, there's nothing I've seen in the Brisbane City Council entry that gives me any indica indication of what has happened in that building. So um, we could see in the 1940s image where they were doing those repairs, um, the awning there um, on the, at the, s the street, but that awning has now been changed. So and we know that's happened. Thank you. Hi, it's Keith Collins from the uh, Veteran Car Club. Um, 
You've mentioned taxi cabs a few mm. times. I was just wondering if you have uh, any breakdown on the manufacturer's name of those cabs? Um, they were Renault cars with CCM bodies, those first ones, as far as I'm aware, from 1909, and then they were building other um, cabs um, for businesses in um, Rockhampton, Mount Morgan, um, the ones in Toowoomba as well. Um, that's the only information I have. What they might have done um, later, I'm not aware of. They're, they're the only ones I've tracked down. I mean, it's obviously an interest. I mean, it's a broader topic, but the place that cars play in our lives, and I think that is a highly motivating thing. A lot of people here, you know, that, that, that it's cars play a central role in a lot of our lives, and the nature of it, the role that it plays is different now than it was, you know, in the days of CCM, and it was different in the 50s, different in the 80s. But um, you, did you want to talk a little bit about the role that cars play in people's lives and some of the responses you've got from that? Oh, well, um, <laughs> cars are fundamental to our lives now. And um, the, for the CCM, it was um, making their uses um, relevant, you know, and, and educating people how they could uh, use motorisation, whether it was for their leisure um, or whether it was for their business purposes. Um, that was um, their goal in that very early phase um, and probably the whole of their phase of, of existence, whereas that's not, um, that's not their role of motor car sales companies anymore. Um, they would have a different take on what they're selling. They're selling, um, you know, the glamour of uh, the Mercedes-Benz or, mm -hmm. or, you know, the reliability or, so, or those different things. Um, at the same time, reliability was a very important thing. It seems like, I mean, in a CCM lot of, times a lot of too. motoring now is like, I just want to get from A to B, and a vehicle is just a means to get there. But it, it seemed like f motoring was more fun back then. <laughs> it was quite glamorous, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, it looked glamorous, but you know, was it? You know, those heavy gearboxes, yeah, yeah. there's no, no uh, autos, you know, power yeah, yeah. steering in those days. <laughs> and, um, so it was a different experience. It was a, you know, probably was a big adventure and um, and um, an exciting thing to be doing and um, a, a brave new world of, of activities and um, the RA, well, the, AC, the ACQ as it was until after the war um, was part of that. And um, Dodwell, for instance, was a mem an early member of that organisation and um, I think. Um, committee member as well and so they were off having uh, these glamorous events and they'd do speed trials and they'd do um, all sorts of um, a gymkhana that's right they had gymkhanas and someone said to me what on earth is that and I thought well I presume it's like um, you know a horse gymkhana except you're doing it with cars and going around bollards or something like that I don't know maybe someone can tell me the answer. <laughs> There you go. Well, <laughs> <laughs> just a question. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to pass on that anybody who owns a veteran Studebaker or Studebakers up to about 1921, um, uh, Bill Dowd was an assembler at Studebaker and and later became foreman assembler, and he he filed a mark on the back of the um, cylinder block uh, near the firewall for all Studebakers that he assembled for for CCMA. And later on, um, he was pretty much known as a mechanic and people would get him to attend to their shooty baker and he could always check if um, he, knew, he knew his cars from that mark. So if people have one and they find a mark around the back of the block, then they know that it was uh, uh, sold and assembled by CCMA. There's lots of marks in my block. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm Lynn Bennett. I'm the owner of the 1923 Studebaker. My husband's restored, which is out the, the front that you've seen. But also, going to say, not all things were glamorous. Um, one of the exciting things that we found out through history of history, um, re looking through the history of our car, <coughs> excuse me, was it was actually used 
could be reuted as well. So the CCM actually made them to be a, become a ute, so they were very versatile. Now our car was actually out on a property and it actually had um, dynamite in the back and the plunger in the front so they could actually remove the tree, the tree stumps on their property. So not everything was really glamorous. <laughs> I just wanted to you know, make sure it was putting in all its um, warts and everything in there. Thank you. Uh, that's a word that should be added to the, the dictionary, uted. <laughs> uh, presumably the, gro the rapid growth of the uh, car industry um, put pressure on the, on the uh, construction of roads. And, and uh, is there, did you come across any evidence that the car companies were actually active in, in advocating um, oh, yeah. development of roads? Absolutely, uh, yeah, they were. Um, in, in or as often. individual companies or as a, a group of uh, car selling companies? Or did they leave it to the RACQ or <laughs> early? <laughs> Um, well, you can see it in the motoring magazines that they're advocating for better roads. Um, um, the individual um, motor car company would it individually as well, but the Motor Traders Association from 1916 is, is um, formed, um, and I'm sure they were as also, but I don't have a particular, um, you know, reference that I could say, but I know that in the motoring magazines there's definitely calls for better roads and they were um, met in, you know, in the 1920s with the formation of the Main Roads Depart or Commission and then became the Main Roads Department. They did get their way and um, formation of um, better roads like the Anzac Memorial Avenue um, also came through that community push for better roads. Um, and, um, and that was a memorialisation as well. Okay, thanks. Hi. Research. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any statistics on, on these um, old veteran cars, that whether they're brought in complete from America or wherever and just, you know, a sem uh, off the wharf or in a box or were they brought in in, in uh, knockdown form or were they built in par uh, brought in in partial form and, and then the Australians, you know, <coughs> boofed up the rest of it. Are there any stats on how complete these cars were and were they absolutely I fully imported? I think we might America have some answers in the crowd. Do we? Yeah. 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 I don't have the answer to that amazing question. Um, I can't tell you because I haven't really looked into it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Someone else may know the answer that. I mean, they were know they were importing chassis um, and then doing the bodies themselves. Or um, so, but statistics about how many, I don't know. It may well be uh, statistics in the motoring magazines, but I wasn't well, looking. We got at a direct that, answer. I'm so. afraid. <laughs> I have an original photo inside uh, the their assembly works um, in a corner of um, Creek and Adelaide. Um, showing the Studi Baker crates and the vehicles being assemb uh, assembled mm. there. So, uh, and I, it it appears that they were assembling, um, you know, quite quite a number. Mm. Thanks. Good. Yeah. Thank you. But, uh, in your research, did you find out if, given that um, Brisbane is a lot closer to northern New South Wales than Sydney is? Yes. Were they exporting, for a better word? Anything yeah. to Northern New South Wales? Yes, they were because they had an agent, uh, um, a branch in Lismore. So Northern New South Wales was definitely part of their stamping ground where they were selling into. Yeah. Um, probably down to the final questions. Yeah. Oh. Sure. Yeah. yeah um, Matt Burke, Griffiths University. Um, great presentation. Sorry, I missed the very start of it. Apologies. Um, I have a number of students who often come to me and say, "Where do I look for the transport history of Brisbane?" And we don't have a great consolidated, commissioned history of Brisbane yet, really. And it's been a long time since Carol's book, Shaping a City, came out too, in terms of the history of this city. There's, there's, there's a need for updating the histories of Brisbane for our students. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you, do you, that's my view, and I just wonder whether, you, you share that view in any way or you think we need to continue to add to this transport history? Because we've got a, a lot of naive young, young folks <laughs> out there who are desperate to learn. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I can't put my finger on, like you say, just, you know, where do you go for one, one you know, catch-all history. Uh, one, that's, that's right. That's the exactly. Um, it would require um, quite a bit of work to pull together, you know, the main roads, um, annual reports and all those other things um, from that, that primary source plus um, uh, the motoring magazines um, and in the history where there are, um, you know, records of... Um, the council records as well that cover the road creation. So there's a huge amount of work to do to pull all of that together and know it hasn't been done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you commission it and I'll do it. Okay. Right, sounds like something. Yeah, it sounds, sounds, yeah. Like a, Sorry. sounds like a new job. <laughs> yep, last question. Um, I should also say we'll be up for about an hour up in level four, so there'll be plenty of time to pepper. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mark Bennett, the owner of the Studebaker, as we know. Well done, Hilary. Thank Very you, Very well Mark. done. And I just wanted to answer the questions about the containers, and I can talk really to my <laughs> car. Um, my car came in from Can uh, Canada as a flat pack. So it was the chassis, and then it was built in Queensland Silky Oaks, at Canadian Cycle Motor Company in Brisbane. So it was all Queensland Silky Oak and I must admit some Oregon that was in the floor as well, which stands to reason a bit like the Model Ts that they use the packing crates. And funny enough, there was a lady that came in, I'm not sure where she, yep, up the back. Her, I think it was her grandfather, used to drag the Studebaker boxes from the wharf on okay. bullet tray cool. to the Studebaker, a Canadian Cycle Motor Company, and then he would help himself, I think, to the Oregon boxes and made a house <laughs> <laughs> out of what was left. So all of this, so as much as I know, there is a fully imported 23, I know more about 23 Studebakers, um, down at the Inverell Museum is a fully imported, which is mainly steel inside. So inside of it, so they class that, that was an extra 25 pound to buy. So you were up market there. But ours being the colonial, being Silky Oak, Queensland and Canadian Cycle Motor Company is the only one that we know of and I'd be quite happy if someone would come and tell me that we've got one in their backyard <laughs> because I'd love to look at it to make sure it's exactly right. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think that's a pretty good note to end on. Um, I'd just like to thank Hilary again. Thank you. And I'd like to thank um, QUT Business School and the Queensland Library Foundation for making this possible um, and all of our supporters, donors, um, please keep in touch through the usual channels. Um, research reveals um, continues next week with Peter Rowenfeld and also keep an eye out for the call for applications. If you want to do your own research, um, you might want to do the next chapter of Brisbane's Transport History. Um, early 2020, we'll put the call out. So thank you again. Thank you.